I'm Scott Abels, the president and co-founder of PrepJet. I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, Q&A session, if you will, uh, that will be part of a series for you so that you can learn more about the SLP Praxis exam. And joining me today is a certified SLP test, who I'm very happy to say uh, helped develop the program that PrepJet's been offering. Uh, we have uh, quite a large number of SLPs that have assisted in the development and maintenance of the program, but we wanted to do a series of videos for you because obviously we want to educate you about the various elements of the exam. And like all exams, uh, and like all of the different schools, some Schools cover certain things more than other schools. I think that's pretty much fair to say. And we need you to be aware as a good consumer, as well as an SLP, of what to expect, what you need to know, and maybe some of the things that aren't as important as you may think. So Tess, thank you for joining me today. And I'm hoping you can help us sort of demystify, you will, uh, the exam. And before we get into uh, this session, let me say that I also have received quite a number of questions posed by candidates for this exam. So some of the stuff that we're going to be discussing could very well represent the types of questions you yourself would ask if you were meeting with, for instance, Tess. Demystifying this exam is important because there's always myths about all these healthcare exams. We want you to know the facts. And that's what Tess is here to help us with. So, you know, we know that it's normal, it's common for people to have a confidence issues. So there is always some anxiety involved, um, particularly for the praxis. Um, some of the topics that we have to address, which we will throughout the series, we're gonna address in this initial uh, video. Uh, because we need to talk about all uh, three areas of the praxis in the ca uh, content categories. So why don't you walk us through, Tess, and I'll turn it over to you uh, as far as uh, these like topics that applicants could find challenging. Yeah, so some of these questions um, can be more challenging for some SLPs when taking the practice um, because really you might not have studied a lot of these topics in school or your school might not have focused really heavily um, on those topics in particular. Some schools are more education based, some schools are more medical based. Um, so that can be challenging for people um, to address some of those knowledge gaps um, when they're studying for the praxis. Mm -hmm. um, another reason could be that we study a lot of material from the very beginning of our programs all the way up until you graduate. Um, and so some of the information you may have learned really early on um, and you could have forgotten some of it. Um, or, you know, you've been working with more challenging information, and so it's kind of easier to forget some of those basic foundational um, knowledge pieces. So that's typically what we see um, when people are having um, more challenges with certain content summaries. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, I received an email from uh, one person who did our free trial, and they asked this question, uh, because I did post uh, an email to several people who have gone through our program. And this was one of the questions uh, that was asked. What is the foundations and professional practice content ca category all about? What does it really cover? Can you help so we can understand better? Definitely. So this is a big content category. It includes a lot of things. Um, but overall, um, it contains the foundational knowledge that you need in order to practice. So to provide services, treatment, um, evaluations in order to do all of that safely and effectively. Um, so it's all about that really foundational kind of basic knowledge. It's not basic, but um, the things that are going to be universal across the SLP profession. Um, so some of the things that are included in that 
are like typical development, performance across the lifespan, um, factors that influence different kinds of um, disorders and their development, um, epidemiology, characteristics of all the disorders, um, culturally and linguistically appropriate service delivery, counseling, collaboration, teaming, documentation, um, and then two really big sections um, that a lot of times are not really uh, focused on heavily in grad school is ethics and legislation, um, and sometimes research methodology. Um, so those are some big areas um, within those uh, that overarching um, content summary of foundational knowledge. <laughs> when you uh, worked on the most recent version of, of our program, I'm just curious, uh, uh, because I was interested in when, like swallowing disorders, for instance, um, I'm assuming, is it fair to assume that most schools would cover that information? Yes. Because most, of this field? Definitely. So most schools have, I think to be accredited, um, there is a swallowing course that everyone has to take. Um, mm -hmm. But depending on the program you go to, some might have two courses, some might just have one. Um, right. Some might just be really brief kind of overviews and some might be really in depth. Thank you. Um, so in your experience, um, what topics in foundations and professional practice uh, content category tend to be, for instance, the most challenging, the most difficult? Uh, which ones are... Maybe I should put it this way. Which ones do your colleagues tend to worry about the most? And was that taken into account when you recently worked on our program? Yeah, so um, everyone kind of has their own areas that they feel less confident in. But overall, most people agree that there are some areas that everyone typically wants more practice with before they take the test. Um, so a couple of those areas are definitely the timing and sequence of developmental milestones for language acquisition. Um, these can be really particular. Um, it's a lot of just memorization with those. Um, another area is characteristics of disorders. Um, you know, more, mostly the medical setting, things you're gonna see in the medical setting. So aphasia, dysarthria, and dysphagia. Um, brain structures and their functions, and then also the systems involved in phonology, articulation, swallowing. Um, so all of those kind of anatomical, um, all the anatomical information as well as the physiology that goes behind um, all of the anatomy in our systems. Um, the auditory system, including um, ear anatomy, a lot of people want more information on that. Um, another area that is kind of challenging sometimes are the ethical principles. Um, so ethical principles um, are things that, you know, in school, we're not really having to make these decisions by ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. We're always there with somebody else who's making those decisions and kind of directing us. Um, but when you're faced with a scenario, um, it can be challenging if you haven't read through um, all the ethical principles on your own. Um, and last but not least, research methodology. That one's definitely something that I think people just kind of forget about sometimes, um, but it is really important um, when studying the praxis. You know, it sounds it sounds like, and I know this uh, in talking to a lot of other SLPs, I mean, this test encompasses a lot of pieces in terms of, uh, I mean, some you might only have X number of questions on it, but it's very broad in terms of all this content knowledge from anatomy, the brain, the ears, swallowing. But then, as you mentioned, ethics, uh, you know, uh, uh, many people, I find, uh, error in ethics simply because of their perception of what the question is asking. I think they do know the ethics. They just have a problem interpreting what the question is focusing on because there could be a lot of junk in the body of that question that misleads them to one of the wrong choices and i think it's important to remind people that on any multiple choice exam 
Three answers are dead wrong. So you can't be torn between two. One is right, three are wrong. And that's just the way you have to approach it. So usually, and I've been doing, you know, licensing in healthcare for almost 37 years. This exam, you really have to just read carefully so that you make the proper selection. And it may not be word for word what you develop in your mind, but there is one answer that comes close to your answer. And that's the one you need to trust and go with. Just some a little bit of advice from someone who's been around the corner. Now, uh, in a moment, we're going to examine a few questions uh, from our program that we're going to share with you. And um, they're going to be asking, these questions will be asking about the foundations that we've been discussing and the professional uh, practice topics. But I think we want to talk briefly, because uh, this has come up several times, about the different types of questions that appear on the praxis. And we know the praxis uh, has a variety of questions because it covers a variety of subjects. So I think moving on, let us move forward to this. Uh, as far as you are concerned, Tess, can we talk about um, uh, the kinds of questions that will appear, uh, could appear on an applicant's exam? Definitely. So there are recall questions and there are application questions. So the recall questions, these are most similar to like uh, the quiz question um, in prep chat material. Um, these are questions that are very straightforward. A lot of it is just rote memorization. What do you remember? It's going to ask you a, a question and then usually it's a one or two word answer and that's kind of it. Um, you know, it might be a little bit longer here and there, but it's based on your memorization and your understanding of the information. Then there's also the application questions where there's a scenario that's presented to you and you are going to have to take that information presented to you um, and analyze it, make a judgment based on the information to answer the question. Um, and some of those application questions, a lot of times, what, we're see, what we see is that they're more challenging because they have to you have to integrate a lot of different information sometimes um, in order to reach the correct answer. Um, you may need to understand different treatment approaches as well as different characteristics of a certain disorder. Um, but even with that being the more complicated question, um, everything that you need to answer the question is in that scenario. Um, and it's really important to read through that really carefully and don't add anything um, else to it. Don't assume anything about the question. Um, the question can be answered based on just that information. Tess, I think you uh, brought with you uh, an example of a recall question. I think we should put it up for our viewers. Yeah, definitely. So here is the um, example recall question. Um, this one's about Broca's aphasia. As you can see, it's just a very um, quote unquote simple question. It's just one sentence. Some recall questions might be two, um, but the answers are very straightforward. You just need to know the answer of the question. Um, and then here we can also can look at an example of an application question um, mm -hmm. from our program. Um, so you can see from this question, this is an actual scenario. Um, some questions might be clinical situations or ethical dilemmas, um, asking you to make a decision or judgment, um, but it's going to be a question about what you would do if you were working with a client, if you were working with patients or a parent even. Um, and so looking at this question, most application questions are just standalone cases. So there's the, or there's the question and then there's one question that goes along with the case. Um, but there are some questions in some scenarios that have three or four uh, questions based on that scenario. So you might be answering a question about um, diagnostics. Um, you might be answering a question about treatment. Um, you might be also answering a question about ethics within the case. So you can be asked multiple things based on that one case. Um, so based on the, the praxis, half of the questions are going to be recall questions, and then the other half are going to be application questions. Thanks, Tess, for, for sharing both of these uh, 
PowerPoints, I want to share with our applicants that we're not going to tell you the answers because uh, we have a free diagnostic exam, which is used to measure your strengths and your weaknesses. And it is a shortened version, if you will, of the praxis, but it addresses questions that you could see and in just about every area. So we're not gonna tell you the answers because you need to take the diagnostic test that is part of the free trial that PrepJet offers all of you. We will share with you the answers to the other questions we will address in this video. So Tess, where do we go now? All right, so we are going to look at one of the questions um, from the foundations and professional practice uh, content category. Um, and so we're going to look at a question from typical development and performance across the lifespan. Um, and so you can read the question up here on the screen. Um, and it's going to be a recall question. So this is just asking you plain and simple about language development. Um, all right, so looking at this question, the correct answer is C present progressive ing, uh, regular plural s, past regular eb, and contractible uh, copula. So the, that's the right question, or the right answer to that question. Um, so we're looking for what order do those grammatical morphemes um, develop from earliest to latest? So that is answer C. Um, and so when we're looking at this, we need to like really study the basics. Um, every one of these answer choices has grammatical morphemes in it. Um, so you can't just go, oh, where, which question has the grammatical morpheme in it? Um, you need to know the basics. You know, you need to know um, how the development of grammatical morphemes occurs. Um, so, Really, we just need to make sure we're memorizing things that need to be memorized. And so when we developed our content summary, um, we kept this in mind that there are a lot of recall questions. And so we presented the information in a really easy way. Um, so a lot of this information is in tables, it's in charts. Um, you know, the explanations are underneath a lot of the tables or before the tables um, so that, you know, you do get a lot of the extra content, the, um, you know, the understanding of it that you really need um, because you can't just, you know, memorize a chart and be good to go. Um, but at the same time, it's presented in that chart so you can memorize it and then it's given you uh, lots of additional information. Um, so kind of going back to this question, um, one of the test taking tips I would say for this question um, is to go through a process of elimination. Um, so we know uh, present progressive ing is the first grammatical morpheme acquired. So that right there, you know, that's answer C. Um, the other answers list the grammatical morpheme somewhere in the middle of the list. So you've gotta, gotta know those basics. Um, and another helpful tip um, can just be to kind of scan the answers for a clue, um, you know, and kind of go back to your, um, even your clinical practice or your um, understanding, like your, uh, uh, like the clinic setting at your, in your school, um, you know, maybe you've worked with a small child before um, and, you know, kind of think back, what, what were the first grammatical morphemes maybe they were saying or what they weren't saying, what you were working on with them. So thinking of, you know, maybe a patient or a client that you've interacted with um, really might kind of help you um, get a better grasp um, of some of these recall questions if you're not 100% sure. Um, so another uh, tip and really just a really good test strategy, um, always guess on a question. Even if you're not 100% sure, go ahead and guess on the praxis. Um, it's not going to, um, um, you know, give you minus point. You're not losing points um, if you get a question wrong. You're only getting points if you get a question right. So you always want to guess. Um, and then on the practice, it also gives you the option to flag a question or save a question. So at the end of the test, after you've gone through and marked all of your answers, you can go back to the, um, 
it's like a page with all the, the question numbers on it. You can see which ones you flagged and you can go back and look at each one of those and change your mind, maybe take a little bit of extra time. Um, so we don't wanna spend too much time on each question. Um, we wanna make sure we answer the question, make your best guess and come back if you have time at the end. Um, time at, most people have plenty of time to take the praxis. Um, I think it's important to keep the time in mind um, and to be aware of it. Um, however, I don't believe that it is anything that um, is really challenging for people. Um, typically, people have a lot of extra times, myself, my colleagues, um, friends that I, you know, have taken the test have all had plenty of time. So make your guess, go back and review later. Tess, let's uh, take a look at another case that requires SLPs to apply their knowledge about language development. Yeah, so here is a question, um, an application question based on this scenario. Um, and so the correct answer for this question is answer D. Not all children are saying true words at age 14 months and expressive jargon is normal at this age. Um, so when looking at this question, um, we immediately can rule out answers A and B because our first words um, are most commonly spoken between 12 and 18 months. So age 14 months, is not um, indicative of a delay or a disorder. Um, so this child in this scenario um, is presenting as typical um, according to answers A and B. So we can rule those out. So when we're looking at this question, also answer C. So that says that true words at age 14 months, um, you know, are not saying true words. So that's that's true, that's accurate. But when we look at the second part of this question or the answer, canonical babbling um, is normal at this age. That's the answer. Um, canonical babbling is not normal at age 14 months old. That is not typical. Canonical babbling typically happens between six and 10 months of age. Um, answer B, also, we can rule that out, telegraphic speech, um, combining two sentence, two words together to make a sentence, me go, um, and that typically emerges between 18 and 24 months. So kind of, you got to look at all the answers and all the pieces of each answer to rule out which, to rule out the ones that are incorrect and choose the correct answer. Um, so... The other thing you need to do is make sure you're reading the questions really carefully. Um, the questions also contain a lot of different information. There's multiple pieces of information. Um, this case scenario is a little long, but it's probably not gonna be the longest one you see um, on the praxis. So make sure to read and digest what you're reading um, so that you have all the information you need in order to answer the question correctly. Um, kind of along those same lines, pay, pay attention to the little details. Um, it's 14 months of age. That little detail is really important. Um, it's not, you know, 10 months to 20 months. It's not 10 to 15 months. It's a very specific age of 14 months old. And you need to know what happens um, in typical development at 14 months of age. Um, so don't rush through the scenarios. Don't rush through reading through the questions. Take your time. You'll have plenty of time to read through the scenarios. All the questions, answers, probably go back and check you your know, answers. Tess, forgive me for interrupting you, but you know, that is an excellent point you're making. In almost every healthcare license or, license or certification exam that we've worked with, applicants sometimes have a tendency because there's a little bit of anxiety involved they read too fast. I've often felt, and I don't know if you would say that this is appropriate for the praxis, but for many licensing exams, I've always thought it made good sense. For instance, you just identified a key term, the age. Um, I also think what helps people to stay clear of getting misled, because all multiple choice questions have sentences that have nothing to do sometimes with the answer. They might be misleading. 
I've always wondered, uh, and I don't know if this applies to the SLP, but if I read the last two sentences of the question first, I'm going to know what they're asking, and now I'm going to read the whole question. Would that give me an advantage in being clear on what the question is so I don't get misled, in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really great strategy to know what you're going to have to answer um, after you read the case scenario. The only thing to keep in mind, though, is that some of those um, scenarios may have more than one question, but it still will give you a better sense of what you need to look for first, maybe kind of put on a different lens that you would have had originally. Um, so definitely a good strategy to do that. The next item is on a topic that we're going to explore that requires the application of knowledge in a different way. Tess? All right. So looking at this question, um, the correct answer is C. Um, you would be working first on the R sound. Um, so kind of jumping into this question, uh, there's a lot of different pieces of information. So this one's a little bit different than the previous application question because you have to know um, the treatment approaches that are available to SLPs. You need to know the treatment approaches. Um, and then you also need to know something about language development to answer it correctly. So you kind of have to pull from these two separate areas, but they're they're very closely interrelated. Um, so kind of looking back through this, you know, we need to select a target based on developmental norms for speech sound development. Um, so we're going to be selecting a target based on how um, uh, children develop their sound system and develop their articulation. So R is typically developed before, um, let's see, voice, is it? unvoiced TH. Um, if you go back and look at your acquisition um, chart, um, speech sound acquisition chart, you will see unvoiced TH sound um, comes after the R sound. So we would we can rule out D because we know the R sound comes before the unvoiced TH. Now answer A is incorrect because that's actually talking about a dynamic systems approach to target selection that is not a um, developmental approach. Um, in the dynamic systems approach to target selection, we're focusing on teaching and stabilizing the simple sounds first um, that the student is already um, able to produce, ones that they're stimulable before, before you build up to more complex sounds, but it's not a developmental approach. Um, so that that's why uh, answer C is correct. Um, so kind of some tips and tricks about this, um, you know, case scenario. Um, one way to kind of look at it is what would you do in this situation if you were in the clinic with a child that presented like this? What are you going to do for them? How are you going to structure your approach? Um, how, if you need to do a developmental approach, how would you do that? Um, so that's definitely a helpful tip. I know we've kind of talked about that before, um, but really in this scenario, that kind of works really well because you would be explaining to a parent, why are we working on R before unvoiced TH? Um, it's a developmental approach. Um, the other, you know, process of elimination you can do, um, you know, that kind of helps you rule out answer A immediately because you know that's not a developmental approach. So um, lots of different skills that are being uh, tested here um, and a lot of different test taking strategies that you can use throughout uh, the Praxis exam. Well, this is really good information. I wanna thank you, Tess, for, for walking us through all this. You know, we're gonna have additional uh, sessions like this. This is just the first and I wanna thank Tess for walking us through this today and uh, our videographer Ethan I want to thank him as well you know I think it's important that if you're watching this I want to encourage you again to use the free trial 
cost you nothing. And I'll, and I'm going to say something that might sound a little strange. Um, I've been licensing healthcare professionals since 1989. And I will tell you, uh, we would not, and my, my partner, Dr. Markovitz, we would never put a product out there unless we knew the content was spot on to the people behind this, including our editor, who I've known since forever, almost 40 years, I can just tell you, this is all you need. Now, there are some people that I know come to us. They're using another program as well as this. But I want to remind you that our goal at PrepJet, because we're not charging very much money, because we don't need to. We want to be a program of attraction. And I think by incorporating exam questions along with very, very tight and specific content, content that ties back to questions, and there's no puff. So we're not teaching you all this general nonsense. We're just addressing what you need to know to be armed to pass your exam. And you're going to do it on a shoestring if you come to us. And if you don't come to us, I understand that's fine. But I highly urge you to do the diagnostic. Take a look at one of our, uh, you'll get to see a percentage of questions in one of our mock exams or a summary. I think it would be very good for you to take a look because we looked at everybody's programs and we wanted to something that took the best of everything that's out there, but condense it, synthesize it, and make it not overwhelming, but all, but more uh, efficient, but also affordable. Again, my name is Scott Abels. I'm the president of PrepJet, and I want to thank you for visiting with us today, and I'll see you on our next video gathering. Thank you.